Good afternoon and welcome to today's Trust and Estates webinar, How to Benefit from New Hampshire's Trust Laws. This webinar is sponsored by Fiduciary Trust. I'm Susan Lipp, Editor-in-Chief of Trust and Estates. In a moment, I'll be turning things over to our speakers, but first let me explain how you can get the most out of this event. To improve your viewing and listening experience, you can move your webcast windows around by dragging on the title bar or resize them by clicking on your lower right corner. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find multiple application widgets. By clicking on these buttons, you can open and close widgets on your screen, but that won't remove you from the webinar. A copy of today's slide presentation and additional resources are available for download in the resource list widget. Please note that this webinar has been accepted for one CE credit hour towards the AEP designation program. The live broadcast of this event has been approved for one CFP board CE credit hour. Investments and Wealth Institute has accepted this program for one hour of CE credit towards the CIMA, CPWA, CIMC, and RMA certifications. Instructions for credit submittal are available in the resource list widget. For those attorneys in the audience getting a continuing legal education credit, please listen for a code word that will be stated at some point during the webinar. To get your CLE credit, attorneys must put that code word into the survey that appears at the end of the webinar. Attorneys must also include their bar number and state of practice to receive the CLE credit. You can open the survey at any time by clicking on the survey widget on your screen Again, please note that the code word pertains only to attorneys getting CLE credit. We welcome questions about our topic and we'll answer as many as we can following the presentation, but feel free to submit yours to the queue at any time. Just type it into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen and hit the submit button. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing following today's event. Simply log in using the same URL as you're using today. Now let me introduce today's moderator, Suma Nair, who is Chief Fiduciary Officer for Fiduciary Trust Company. So Suma, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Susan, and hello to our virtual audience. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. David Scott Sloan chairs Holland and Knight's Global Private Wealth Practice. He serves as general counsel to wealthy individuals throughout the United States, their families, and their businesses to design and implement sophisticated strategies integral to family wealth planning. High net worth individuals, including principals of private equity, venture capital, and hedge fund firms, private and public company executives, real estate developers, entrepreneurs, and business owners, turn to David for advice and counsel in all aspects of wealth transfer strategies, income and transfer tax planning, philanthropy and business succession. David currently serves as a trustee of Berkeley College of Music. He's a fellow in the American College of Trust and Estate Council and has published numerous articles and has been quoted in several publications and interviewed on television and radio. David earned a BS from Binghamton University, a JD from Albany Law School and an LLM in taxation from Boston University School of Law. David, thank you so much for being here and providing your expertise today. Next, my colleague Thonda Fields Broussard serves as Fiduciary Trust of New England's General Counsel and Chair of its Trust Committee. She played an instrumental role in establishing FTNE in 2014 and growing it to over $5 billion of assets under supervision. She is one of the country's leading experts in New Hampshire trust law and has extensive experience enabling a variety of clients to benefit from the Granite State's trust laws, including uh, high and ultra high net worth family offices, business owners, family offices, international clients, and private family trust companies, to name a few. Prior to joining Fiduciary Trust Company in 2006, Thonda was an associate at Ropes and Gray in the private client group. She is active in the community, serving on the boards of several charities, including Judge Baker's Children's Center. Thonda earned a BA and JD degrees, both from Boston College. Thank you, Thonda, for being with us today for this important discussion. And now a word about Fiduciary Trust Company. We are very proud to sponsor this presentation. Fiduciary Trust Company was founded almost 140 years ago and has a long history of integrity and financial stability. 
We are privately owned and free from misaligned objectives and are extremely proud of our 98% average client retention rate for the past decade plus. We have a deep bench of highly experienced trust and estate lawyers, including Thonda, who support every aspect of our fiduciary services, allowing us to be nimble and provide bespoke solutions to our clients. We provide a range of trustee services, including directed and delegated trustee arrangements, charitable trust and foundation trusteeship, and have access through fiduciary trust of New England to New Hampshire's advantageous trust laws. And since that's the focus of our discussion today, let's get to it. The topics for discussion today will be key benefits of New Hampshire's trust laws, including tax savings and other aspects. We are also going to talk about migrating existing trusts um, to New Hampshire. If you've already got an irrevocable trust that, that um, is established under another state's laws. And then also how New Hampshire trust laws can be used to modify existing trusts. Finally, we're going to go through some case studies and examples of how New Hampshire's trust laws have been able to help our clients. And then lastly, as Susan mentioned, we will be taking audience questions at the end. However, if there are questions that, co that come to mind during the presentation, as long as it doesn't interrupt the flow of the discussion, I'm happy to ask those questions timely as we're speaking about a particular topic. So please don't hesitate to go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A. All right, without further ado, I pass it on to David and Thonda. All right, thank you, Suma. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, from a trust perspective, uh, there are several things that are attractive about New Hampshire. First and foremost, we look to New Hampshire, there's no state income tax. And for those of us uh, sitting in Massachusetts, income taxes are on everybody's mind. Um, also, when we consider setting up a trust in New Hampshire, you know, there's lots of different states to, to set up trust. We are attracted by several things, and probably the, the three or four things that come top of mind are really that there's no rule against perpetuity. So the dynasty trust aspect, the fact that we can use directed trust where we can divide or bifurcate or trifurcate the duties traditionally given to a trustee, that's very attractive. Um, the decanting laws in New Hampshire have been very helpful. We've decanted a lot of trusts uh, that were formed in other states uh, into New Hampshire. And then for some clients, one of the attractive things is uh, the quiet trust nature of New Hampshire's statutory uh, scheme. And hear David and say that, you know, from a trustee perspective, the administrative flexibility that exists in New Hampshire's trust laws is, is really attractive and can solve a lot of clients' problems. Um, some of those items of uh, which allow flexibility include total return trusts and the power to adjust. Um, virtual representation, which is when you have an older generation virtually representing a younger generation um, in something like an NJSA, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, we have some great sustainable investing laws, which encourage ESG investing in irrevocable trusts in New Hampshire. Um, that's also very helpful in this day and age. Um, there's a trustee modification statute, uh, which allows for administrative provisions in a trust to be modified without beneficiary consent. So if you need to you know, make a quick amendment, there, there's a possibility of doing it through that statute. Pre-mortem validation of trusts. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. And on a related but not related topic, it's, it's not on this list, but I want to talk about, um, or at least I want to mention that um, in New Hampshire, there's this great statute about letters of wishes, um, which relate to trust. So we encourage our clients to write letters of wishes saying what they wish and want, but not require um, the trust assets to be used for. And what's great about the statute is that it treats and says that these letters of wishes are exactly that. They're not amendments to the trust. The trustee is not required to adhere to them, um, but they provide guidance, which, which is great as a, as a trustee. And so um, we have that special statute. I don't know of any other state that, that has that. Um, so I wanted to mention that here. Um, in addition, um, some administrative flexibility can be seen through um, the adoption of many uniform trust code elements, including the Principal and Income Act. We'll talk a little bit about that, as well as non-judicial settlement agreements. And what I love about the New Hampshire laws is that they are really created so that you don't have to go to court 
But if you do need to go to court, it's really nice that New Hampshire has its own dedicated trust court, which allows for resolution of any um, any issues that, that are governed by New Hampshire law. We'll talk about that later as well. So on the taking apart each each of the things that we talked about on the tax side if you set up a non-grantor irrevocable trust in new hampshire uh, there is no interest dividends capital gains tax there's no throwback rules or new hampshire tax on accumulated income and in fact there's no real compliance there's no filing requirement at all um, of course you have to file the federal tax returns but there's nothing from the new hampshire side and so that is is very attractive from both compliance as well as there's going to be no surprises uh, with grantor trust non-issue it's, it's taxed to the donor wherever the donor happens to live the next, yeah. yes and i'm happy to talk about self-settled asset protection trust which we have in new hampshire um, and which I've seen an uptick in interest by clients, I would say in the last five to 10, five years or so. Um, the guiding premise here is that a beneficiary's interest in a trust, even an irrevocable trust that was established by the donor is not a property interest for creditors. Um, in, in New Hampshire, you can set up these as types of asset protection trusts with the donor as a discretionary beneficiary and the donor can also retain a limited power of appointment over the assets. Um, and as, as a general rule, if, if that's done, the trust assets are protected from most creditors four years from the date the assets are transferred into the trust or for creditors that exist at trust funding one year after the creditor knew or should have known of the transfer. transfer. Some exceptions to creditor claims are child support and basic alimony claims. Those will always be able, you will always be able to reach the trust for those. Um, but these exception creditors can only attach present or future trust distributions. So there is still some protection there. Um, in terms of the trustee, the trustee doesn't have to be a New Hampshire resident or trust company, but it is usually helpful to name a New Hampshire trustee to really solidify the nexus with New Hampshire and thus limit the number of states in which creditor claims may be brought. Another nuance of New Hampshire is really its, it's quiet trust statute. And uh, under, under New Hampshire law, uh, you can have limited information that you provide to the beneficiaries or to anybody. Um, and there's, there's a default notice rule, but even that can be overridden by the terms of the trust. Now, on the one hand, that's very attractive to some people who don't want to let their children or grandchildren know anything that's out there. Um, as a practitioner, just because you can do it, I don't necessarily always default to doing it because I think there also needs to be some checks and balances. Somebody should be looking at something. Somebody should be accounting to somebody. And, um, and we have had clients approach us say, oh, I've heard all about these quiet trusts. I don't want anyone to know anything about this. And I say to them, okay, well, that's good until it's not. <laughs> and so there, <laughs> there needs to be somebody out there that, that should know what's going on that's, that's looking at what's going on. And Thon, I don't know if, what, what you're getting as far as uh, pushback or, or people that want to do it. Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting concept that, that a lot of donors like because they don't want the knowledge of the wealth to affect the beneficiary's actions in life and, the, and lifestyle, um, which is understandable to a point. And I, but because I think the point at where that becomes complicated is that, like you said, somebody should probably be getting these notices. And, and you know, I think that transparency um, between a trustee and beneficiaries is, is incredibly helpful at the end of the day and also helpful from a trustee perspective knowing that that someone is is watching over us believe it or not um, we actually welcome that as as a trustee so um, I agree with you there's there's sort of two sides to the quiet trust but it seems to be very um, a lot of interest in this and I would say in the last couple of years I've seen yeah definitely and, I, and, and possibly you could have the, the trust protector be that that person and so you, it kind of melds with your virtual 
representation <laughs> type of idea that somebody is at least out there watching. That's right. David and Thanda, we've had a couple of questions come into the Q&A about quiet trust. Can you talk a little bit about when you generally see quiet trust provisions being used and in what context? Uh, go ahead, Thanda. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to take that. I mean, I think, I think we, I tend to see, uh, for whatever it's worth, I tend to see quiet trust used where there's a larger gap between an age between the donor um, and and the the next generation. So meaning meaning when the next generation is is younger. So pre you know twenty five years old, I'd say before before college, um, you know, or even younger. Um, you tend to see that because you, I think the purpose of it usually is that you just don't want those beneficiaries changing their lives because they know that there's this wealth out there. You want them to do, at least the donor wants them to do whatever they would normally do and go to college and, you know, um, do some, do a, find a vo vocation that they like. Um, so that's when I see them used. I, I'd say they're not as used if the donor is establishing a trust and the kids are older and established. Um, although sometimes, you know, where there are known creditors or uh, assumed to be creditors in the future, I think that's that's another reason to set up a quiet trust for for the next generation, even if they're older. I know what you think, David. No, I agree with that. Mo most of the push that I've had is when we have um, someone, a, a grandparent, setting up trust for grandchildren. Maybe not your traditional dynastic trust where you have their children and then grandchildren, et cetera, but they're pinpointing it towards grandchildren. The grandchildren are young and they really don't, they not only don't want to ruin them, but they don't want to ruin any incentive. Um, those, those clients also often uh, execute letters of wishes. And so your reference earlier to the letter of wishes is really helpful because I know in, in some states people have been wondering, is this binding? It's not in the trust. And so I, I, I like that part of it. Um, I had one client say to me, you know, I want a quiet trust. I don't want my grandchildren to know the wealth I have, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to this client, um, pull out your iPhone and Google yourself because I can assure <laughs> you your grandchildren already have. So that ship has sailed, but, you know, you can at least keep them from knowing how much money is out there in the future for them. Yep. Good point. Good Thank question. Thank you both for expounding on that. That was really helpful. So civil law foundations, I mentioned this in the beginning of our discussion here. Um, civil law foundations are um, a great wealth management vehicle for um, foreign clients. They combine features of corporations and limited liability com companies, but they act like a trust. Um, there are civil law countries which don't recognize trusts as wealth management vehicles. So um, in 2017, New Hampshire became the first state to allow the creation of these civil law foundations by statute. Um, and because these structures are utilized in many civil law countries instead of trust to manage and distribute family wealth, what this does is it allows you to set these up in, in the United States and basically onshore assets. David, I don't know, uh, you and I have been around for a while, but I don't know if you remember when there was a time when everyone was trying to offshore assets, um, and now it seems it's come full circle, and this is an incredible tool for um, non-US citizens to bring their wealth to the US, which, which sometimes is deemed as very safe and stable. Uh, it is amazing how it has switched. Uh, we have a big international planning group, and, and this is the best place <laughs> to do that kind of planning. Uh, and yep. That was not so 20 or 25 years ago. Yeah, it's very different. Terrific. Okay, I'm going to pass it back over to Susan very quickly, who's going to give us our CLE code. Thank you. And for those attorneys who want CLE credit, the code word is benefit. So put that word benefit in the survey that appears at the, the end of the webinar and you should be able to get your CLE credit. Um, back to you. Thank you, Susan.
Okay, now we're getting into a little bit more of the meat of um, the types of provisions that you can see in New Hampshire um, that make New Hampshire trustees and trusts a little bit different. So we're gonna start with directed and divided trusts. Um, one question did come in um, at a little bit earlier, Thonda, when you were talking about civil law foundations, one of the questions was how do you access quiet trust provisions? And I think it is important to talk about how quiet trust provisions can be incorporated. It is not a statutory default. Good point. So effectively you'd have to, if your trust doesn't have quiet trust provisions, by moving it to New Hampshire, and we'll talk about migrating a trust to New Hampshire, you would then uh, decant or administratively amend the trust to allow for these directed or these um, quiet trust provisions to be included in your document. And obviously, as both David and Thonda discussed, if you're not going to be reporting to the beneficiary, there most trustees, I think most fiduciaries would ask that there's someone to whom they are reporting, so that there is some person that the um, that the beneficiaries interests are being looked at by um, and being monitored by during the course of the quiet time. Okay. Absolutely. That's a nice segue into directed and divided trusts. Yep. Yes, and I, and I won't be giving any passwords or any special words. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, um, it's interesting because when I started practicing law, it, it was simple. You executed a trust, you interviewed a trustee, and the trustee did everything. They did the investing, they did the accounting, they had a discretionary committee to decide on distributions. Um, really the, 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 full, the, the full boat of what a trustee does. And in New Hampshire, uh, what they've done is, is taken all of those different pieces that a trustee can do and all the different duties they can discharge and they've really broken them up, um, either bifurcate, trifurcate, or whatever the word is after three. Um, and so you have um, distribution advisors who can decide specifically on distributions to beneficiaries. You have investment advisors who can pinpoint and direct the trusts and those trust assets. And those assets don't have to be invested with the trustee. They can be invested anywhere. Those are two things that are very important to clients when I'm speaking to them about setting up a directed trust. Um, you can have different trust advisors. You can have trust protectors that have special powers, uh, including the power to subsequently decant the trust or potentially amend the trust, or in a quiet trust setting, be the party that gets notice and gets accountings. And so one of the best things about the directed trust statute is that you can divide and conquer and that's very attractive to a lot of clients. And so in a pure, pure directed trust, um, the trustee is solely administering the trust in New Hampshire. Um, they are being directed on how to make distributions, they're being directed on what investments the trust will have um, and a variety of other matters. The question always, of course, becomes, what if, now that you've divided and conquered, what if the distribution advisor is doing his or her job, but the investment advisor is not? Are these various people fiduciaries and are they responsible for the acts or omissions of the others? And uh, in New Hampshire, and, and we always make sure to underscore this in our trust, um, you, can, you can establish and be very clear that you're not responsible for the duties, discharge of duties of others and that could even go, and Thonda, I'm guessing you're seeing this, on the duty to monitor, that you don't have to, you don't have to check um, or, or be responsible or have someone say, well, you should have known. It, it makes it much harder to make that case if somebody is unhappy. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody shouldn't be checking, which gets back to our original comment, um, but that is very attractive in the way that the statute is set up and how we have actually used New Hampshire trusts. I, I, I'd like to comment on that. I, we've seen a lot of use of the directed and divided trusts and, and I think it works for both um, the clients and the trustees because it's very clear who does what and it allows everyone to stay in their own lane, do, you know, do what they do well, um, and it's different from a delegation. You're you're right in in uh, you know in 
the old school way we used to administer trust, if you wanted to work with someone else, you, you had to delegate, let's say, investment responsibility to, to another party. And while that's helpful, um, you still have a duty to choose an appropriate person in that role or company to take that role, and you have a duty to monitor, as you mentioned. Um, in divided and directed trust, you don't have that. It's really and truly an open architecture approach to trust administration, and it's so it's, it's a modern way of administering trust. And I think that you know clients, donors like setting up these trusts um, to utilize all their different advisors. And I think the advisors, including the trustee, like these trusts because it's very clear what they what they need to do and what they don't need to do. Um, and so I think it's, uh, like I said, we've seen a, a real uptick in using these types of trusts in the last couple of years. No, and, I, and I think uh, th that is important that the old days, it was delegation. And because it's not delegation and it's a pure investment advisor, it allows us to use um, these types of trusts to carry out some sophisticated planning techniques where we're setting up LLCs and we're creating non-managing member interests and then we are giving away the non-managing member interest to a trust. It's much better if that's housed in a directed trust environment and you have the investment advisor saying, let's, let's hold these LLC non-managing member interests. Um, I'm not sure in a, in a delegation environment if that would necessarily pass muster. Um, and so that becomes very important if you're doing that kind of planning. Right. And um, one thing that I, I want to add here in terms of the advantages of New Hampshire, you know, directed trusts are very well supported by case law in New Hampshire. Um, and so I think what's nice about it is that the parties, meaning the clients setting up the trusts and the trustees and all the advisors can feel confident that what they're doing is supported by by case law as well. Um, you know, it's allowed by statute, but there's some nice case law which supports it as well. So that's that's always um, comforting. There's a bit of a differentiating factor for New Hampshire too. I know in other states, the case law has not been as clear with respect to directed trusteeship um, scenarios. And so having a dedicated trust court that understands these laws and the modernization of these laws really does help New Hampshire have more consistency with respect to implementation of these statutes. That's right. And, and not every state even has directed and divided trust laws. So, um, you know, you don't even have an option there. Almost, I would think that you could always delegate, but it really is a different situation and a different liability for the trustee. So one of the questions that's come in is, are, are trustees or fiduciaries protected if they don't diversify the assets of the trust, like when there's a single asset or a closely held business interest in trust? Yeah, I can, I can take that. There's some nice statutes in New Hampshire um, which allow for non-diversification, um, basically you know, taking that part of the prudent investor rule and um, writing it out. So you have to express that preference specifically in the trust. Um, but yes, you can, you can do that, which is another, which is one reason why people set up, um, trusts in New Hampshire and have them administered there because they know that if they've got, let's say a large concentration of stock, um, and they don't want the trustees to start diversifying those assets, they can put that in their trust and, and know that it'll be respected. And it's, it's really helpful in the example I gave earlier where you're holding just a non-managing member interest in an LLC, because technically from a trust perspective, that's a single asset. And so we make sure to mention it in the trust and, and reference New Hampshire law. And I, sh I should add that um, part of the reason for this type of provision in New Hampshire's trust laws is the overarching um, desire is in New Hampshire is to always be carrying out the donor's intent. That is really a driver of all, all of these laws that we're, we're talking about to do with the donor intents. And so if you, if you intend to really not diversify, then that, that's, that's allowable in New Hampshire. And so I think that's, that's a nice uh, example of that. 
Um, so here's a topic that was a burning issue two years ago when we had no to negative interest rates and um, trying to stretch definitions of fixed income. Uh, one of the things that, that we looked to in New Hampshire was just the whole uh, opportunity to convert to a unit trust to make sure that you could include an income, some of the principles so that you could get a unit trust type of return. Uh, Thad, I don't know if you were seeing it a lot two years ago, and maybe people aren't talking about it as much now, but I, I know that um, some of our trust beneficiaries, one of the reasons we moved trust to New Hampshire was to step up the return or the definition of income or go to a unit trust because it was just uh, trickling to a halt as far as how much was coming out of the trust by its terms. Definitely. Um, definitely seen also a lot of the power, a lot of use of the power to adjust um, in that type of low interest environment. This is this is a power that allows a trustee um, to utilize its discretion to transfer principal to income. And basically you, it allows you to invest the trust for total return. Um, this can be used when there's no abil ability to transfer principal or to distribute principal to a beneficiary. Um, what's nice about the statute, the power to adjust statute in New Hampshire is that the trustee does not have an affirmative duty to adjust, um, so can't be held liable, held liable for his or her action or inaction. Um, but it, same idea as a unit trust conversion, um, just a different a different power and it's 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 very helpful when you've got this low interest environment um, you want to invest for total return and basically what you can do is you take principal and you recharacterize it as income distribute it and transfer it to the income portfolio and transfer it out to the beneficiary so it's it's a great way of getting some more assets to a beneficiary when you can't distribute principal um, but but also allowing you to invest for total return I've seen a lot, it made a lot of use of that as, as a trustee. It's an incredibly helpful tool to try to balance the interests of the income beneficiaries and the remainder beneficiaries. And Thonda and David, the difference between these two things or one difference between these two powers is unit trust conversion, as I understand it, you can't go back once you've converted, but the power to adjust, you can revisit and should revisit every year. Is that right? Yes, and and so I think the power the power to adjust um, you know is something we would lean towards because of that um, utilizing that you have to be pretty confident that you want a unit trust conversion, um, which now if you had done that you know five years ago now you might be thinking twice about that. Whereas with the power to adjust, it's it's more of a administrative hassle so to speak because you have to adjust every year, um, but it allows you to to work with changing circumstances. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a great tool. So the pre-mortem validation of trusts, I mentioned this in the beginning, um, it, it, and also talking about donor intent, um, really this, this statute in New Hampshire was created in order to help uh, make sure that a donor's intent is being carried out. By New Hampshire statute, a donor can actually, while they're alive, initiate a suit to prove the validity of a trust that they've created. Um, and this is really helpful if the donor is anticipating a challenge to his or her estate plan. Um, you can basically um, validate the trust beforehand. Um, so not everyone is going to want to do this, but again, if you're anticipating a real challenge, it might be helpful to, to do this. Um, in addition, there are some nice limitations on trust contests by statute in New Hampshire. Um, an action, for, uh, for example, an action contesting the validity of a trust can't be brought more than three years after the donor's death, three years after certain information is sent to the trust beneficiary, and three years after certain information, including a copy of the trust, is sent to the potential contestant. So there are some nice rules around validating a trust before death and making sure that there, there are um, timelines for contesting the validity of a trust after death. So any anytime I start talking about trust modification, I, I can't quite help myself to think that I remember when I started practicing law and irrevocable trusts were actually irrevocable. 
and you you set them and you couldn't do anything else with them and and now um we look at irrevocable trust in such a different light and so we have done a lot of decanting and um we're very as i had mentioned earlier the new hampshire has a very progressive decanting statute uh some states including the one i'm sitting in um you're really relying upon case law and their statute is clear uh, the only limits are you can't add beneficiaries or or eliminate any vested beneficiaries uh, there are also circumstances and i believe new hampshire is the only state i've come across where you can decant a trust even if distributions of principal are limited and obviously the counter, counter lever to that is you can't be um, doing that inconsistent with the material purpose of the trust so you really have to look at donor intent so if you're doing that um and donna i imagine you look at this one of the first questions is is the donor still alive and uh, can, can tell us his or her intent uh, but with those caveats we've looked at and used the decanting statue often sometimes to um, fix some trust that really by their terms uh, were fairly limited or they had hardwired age-based distributions to kids and the law of unintended consequences is that i never thought this trust would get this large and i really don't want to send this money out automatically and um and so there's a lot that you can do with the decanting statute and uh, i know thon is going to talk in a little bit about how you do it and what the process is um but Thunder, i don't know if you want to kick to uh, trustee modification yeah i'm happy to do that but before we get there i just want to add my enthusiasm for decanting um you know it's an involved process you need to draft you know the new trust you need to draft the decanting documents so there's some expense there but um it really can accomplish some some great goals and and really um you know give you an an upgrade um in terms of the the trust instrument and the provisions in it you know again there are New Hampshire's great because of the statute. It gives you real, really clear guidelines and parameters for, for decanting. You can't just, you know, uh, decant, you know, without without those parameters. But um, but it is when it works, it works very nicely. So I would agree with that. Um, you know, slightly different um, statutory trustee modification. So there's a, a statute in New Hampshire which allows trustees. Um, to amend administrative provisions in a trust without beneficiary consent. Um, not that I would necessarily um, say that you shouldn't get be beneficiary consent or notify the beneficiaries. Usually that, that is the right thing to do, but you know, let's say you've got minor beneficiaries. Um, this is a, a limited, um, but it's a, it's a way to modify a trust um, and really um, basically to fix an administrative provision in the trust. Um, and similar to decanting um, and other modification tools, the modifications have to be consistent with the donor's intent. Um, it, it's a handy handy little tool. Um, Non-judicial settlement agreements, um, those are also great. A little different from decanting and the trustee modification statute. Um, they allow interested persons to enter into a binding agreement regarding provisions in a trust, um, which can include the construction of the trust terms, termination, or modification of a trust. And so non-judicial settlement agreements um, are often used um, in New Hampshire. And finally, um, the trust court, we talked a little, I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, a specialty trust court was established in New Hampshire in 2014, 2014 to hear just trust litigation cases. Um, and uh, I have an example, which I'll talk about this a little bit later, but it is really nice, um, you know, to have a court that has judges who have specialized knowledge about trust litigation and who can handle and listen to any trust litigation disputes. The whole concept, um, of New Hampshire law is to not have to go to court, but there are times when you when you have to go to court, and it's nice to be able to bring your New Hampshire trust issue uh, um, regarding your New Hampshire trust to a New Hampshire trust court and get some um, 
good good uh, rulings from the courts up there. So how do we access uh, New Hampshire's trust and tax advantages? That might be a, a question um, since you're hearing all this good stuff about what you can do in New Hampshire. There are three basic ways um, and um, you know we we use them all the time. Um, the first is to, is simple. To, it's to establish a new trust to create a new trust which names a New Hampshire trustee and applies New Hampshire law, and then creates New Hampshire trust situs. So just creating a brand new trust. Um, you can change the situs of an existing trust by relocating the trust situs from another state to New Hampshire um, and appointing a New Hampshire trustee to serve as the trustee of that trust. The ability in the process for changing the situs depends on the, exist the terms of the existing trust and of course the state that it's coming from. Um, but sometimes it's as simple as changing the trustee. Um, sometimes you have to undertake a decanting, which is the third way. Um, you can take advantage of New Hampshire's trusts and tax laws. Um, you can decant the assets, which, you know, that's essentially taking the assets in one trust and moving them into a new second trust um, with, and it would be a New Hampshire trust um, with similar terms, but more modernized provisions. Um, and the ability to, dec to decant and ha how exactly you decant uh, depends on the trust instrument of the first trust um, and state laws where the first trust was created and where it's being administered. But ideally, you would have a New Hampshire trustee decant the trust under New Hampshire law and have the New Hampshire trustee stay on as trustee. So those are three three basic ways to to take advantage of New Hampshire's trust and tax laws. And, and I yeah. think just to, to add to that, just a little nuance, sure. if, if you're just doing some gift giving and you want to take advantage of the dynastic nature of New Hampshire laws, yes, a client comes to us, uh, we work with a New Hampshire trustee and the client is the donor of the trust and transfers the assets to the trust. If you have an irrevocable trust that is already outside of the client's estate and you're going to decant it to a new trust, uh, I mean, I've had different um, perspectives from different people, but my preference representing the donor or representing the family is that the trustee actually declare that new trust to which we're decanting into because it's already out of the, the client's estate. And, and Sim, I don't know if, if you're seeing that or if that's your protocol as well or, or what your feelings are. Yeah, um, you know, I, I just think that, um, you know, decanting canting is really, um, it's a more involved process, but I think it, it works really well. And I've just seen so much of it the last the last couple of years. Um, I think it's getting easier because we're all doing more of it. Um, yeah, but that that's a nice segue into our examples, David. Sure. Especially your the beginning part. Yeah, so this is, um, th this, we've been using New Hampshire and the dynastic nature of their, uh, of their trust legislation for a while. And it is certainly a great way, as we have seen increased gift tax exemptions, to utilize gift tax and GST exemption and to put it in a dynastic trust. And so in this example, uh, low basis stock um, that has significant unrealized capital gain. And uh, from a dynastic trust perspective, perhaps there's a whole lot more growth out there in this stock, so a good asset to get out of um, the client's estate, and um, to the extent that you go and then diversify and sell once it's inside of the New Hampshire Trust, you're avoiding the whole state level income tax from that capital gain. And for those of us that are uh, now laboring under the pressure of the millionaire's tax, uh, capital gains in Massachusetts have gotten incredibly more expensive. I know that there are some, some bills talking about how to address it, but I mean, we have in Massachusetts um, a significant short-term capital gain tax. Um, we then have the millionaire's tax once you trip over a million dollars, so you're adding another 4%. Even if it's long-term gain, that's still a lot of money to give away in taxes when you can simply 
uh, move that to a New Hampshire trust, accomplish some of the state planning goals, and when you do monetize, avoid the state level income tax on that asset. I agree with that, David. And, you know, just you had mentioned this before, but just a reminder to everyone that you can't change the federal taxation. Um, but, you know, people, clients are looking for ways to save otherwise. And I think that the, the mass millionaires tax, um, you know, has has really upset people, you know, a lot of people who um, are looking for ways now to to minimize um, income taxes as a way of, you know, trying to get that money instead to future generations. Yeah, my, my guess is there's an uptick uh, in the real estate market in Nashua and uh, other places <laughs> for people that have suddenly decided that in addition to tax, you know, the benefits of skiing and, uh, and hiking trails and other things in New Hampshire are looking much better. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that they're thinking of moving. Um, out of principle, so yeah, that it'll be interesting to see how that might happen. And in in Massachusetts, there's the proposal to increase um, the estate tax, which maybe would counter that um, for some people. But um, you increase know, it's the just exemption, a proposal. right, Donda? In increase the I'm estate sorry. tax exemption. Yes, yeah, sorry, that's what I meant to say. The exemption. Um, so that would be, you know, maybe that would counter some of the frustration um, and maybe that'd be, maybe that would keep some people from, from moving. What do you think, Suma? It's possible. I mean, I think the, the, um, the proposal is to increase the exemption from the current $1 million, which makes Massachusetts an outlier um, within the, the 50 states to $3 million, which is a good movement in the right direction, I would say. But for a lot of states, they have decoupled and um, just simply gone with the federal exemption as being their exemption, which is quite a difference between $3 million and currently over $12 million. So, you yes. know, Massachusetts, <laughs> I think, still has a ways to go. Um, and with New Hampshire having no estate tax at all, um, it is a big difference um, between the two states and, and will likely be a continuing reason for people to try to establish domicile in a non state tax state as they get older. Uh, and even and if 3 million were an outlier, I mean, 3 yeah. million were, were still an outlier. And, and Massachusetts, unfortunately, has a has a bad history in this regard. We used to have a $200,000 exemption. And after years of studies, um, they raised it to a million dollars. And, you know, just own a house and have yeah. an IRA in Massachusetts and you're subject to a estate tax. And so going to 3 million, we're, we're still an outlier. And as one of my clients pointed out, even California, which taxes everything, doesn't tax estates. Right. Right. And for those of you in the audience who are not in Massachusetts and think this might not um, apply to you, there, there are whisperings beginning, um, I've heard, in states like Hawaii and California and a number of other states where they're now considering um, some some sort of um, millionaire's tax. Um, so the tax, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that people I think feel very um, polarized by. And I, I think that they, they feel very strongly about. And so it's, it's definitely for an interesting topic. It was a little bit of a segue but, um, into the <laughs> into the next example, but um, anyway. Um, so I wanted to at least give an example because I, I've i seen so much of fixing broken trust um, and the use of tools that New Hampshire has for doing that, that I wanted to give an example. Um, and so let's say, here's, here's the context, let's say that um, there is in existence an irrevocable non-grantor trust. All the beneficiaries are currently minors. Um, let's say that the trust is a Massachusetts trust um, with a Massachusetts trustee and there's no New Hampshire trustee. Um, and so let's also say that um, because of the, there's a low interest rate environment, um, not much in income is being distributed to the beneficiaries as, as they anticipated and um, the trust does not allow for principal distributions until the youngest beneficiary turns age 35. And let's just assume that 
that's not going to happen for another 17 years, so a, a long time. Um, one thing you can do is you can have the Massachusetts trustee resign. You can have a New Hampshire trustee appointed. So therefore, the trust is now subject to New Hampshire, New Hampshire law. Um, let's say you decant the trust into a new trust. So from the first trust to a second trust that allows for principal distributions. Um, and this, let's say that this checks all the box boxes in New Hampshire, all those um, guidelines um, that I said existed. And so you're not undermining the donor's intent. Um, you're not undermining a material purpose of the trust. So let's, let's say all of that. Um, let's say the new trust now has some directed trust provisions. David, you said that you had clients who, who did a lot of that or who, who did decant and, and add in those provisions. Um, so you can do that. You can, you can modernize the trust even more um, and, and allow for the trust to be a directed trust. Um, each advisor or a trustee can carry out their duties without the oversight of the other fiduciaries. And bonus, um, the New Hampshire trust situs results in no more state income and capital gains tax as long as they're retained in the trust and not distributed out to a beneficiary. So if you distribute income from a trust and not accumulate it, but if you distribute it out to a beneficiary, the beneficiary is always going to get taxed on that income based on where they reside. You had mentioned this, David. Um, so you can't avoid that. But if it's just being accumulated in the trust, you can avoid the state tax on that. So that's a little more complicated example of how you can use the New Hampshire trust laws to uh, fix or amend a broken, what I would call a broken trust. No, and that's, um, that part of uh, decanting in New Hampshire has been most attractive to a lot of our clients. And, you know, maybe when they set up the trust, um, you know, they don't, con they, they weren't considering it broken, but now as you look at it and you look in retrospect and you look at the assets, like, oh, I wish I did this, wish I did this. I don't want to send all this money out at 35. And so we've really utilized New Hampshire a lot for that. And when we have done that, we don't always convert to a directed trust, but we put provisions in the decanted trust that allow for a directed trust. So you can set up a directed trust and still say that if there is, you can provide for an investment advisor, but of course, if one isn't serving, then that's just a traditional trustee role. Same with a right. distribution advisor, those all default. And so it really helps you modernize the trust and, and give it a whole lot more runway um, for the duration of whatever the term of the trust is. So I'm gonna move Great. you guys know. to the last example, just so you can cover it very quickly, Thonda and David. Yep, thank you, Suma. Yes, um, we could talk about this all day, so <laughs> um, it's hard not it's hard not to. Um, the last example I, I wanted to get to was talking about um, why it's great to have a dedicated trust court in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is pretty pretty unique in that regard. Um, so let's say you've got um, let's say that you want to um, make sure or or you want to have a good a well-informed decision of, regarding a beneficiary's interest in a trust in the event of a beneficiary's divorce it can be a different creditor, but let's use that as an example. Um, and the challenge is trying to keep separate assets from commingling with marital assets during the marriage, and then you want to keep them protected in the event of a divorce. Um, so what you could do is you could establish and fund an irrevocable New Hampshire asset protection trust prior to the marriage with separate assets. The trust can be established for the benefit of the client and future issue. Um, so it allows for generational succession in addition to the asset protection, which is nice. Um, and then let's say parties get divorced. Let's say they're even in New York. They're not even in New Hampshire. Um, in, that, in that case, issues regarding whether the trust is a marital asset could actually still be brought in the New Hampshire dedicated trust court. Um, and that would allow for uh, a judge with experience working on trust litigation issues, um, would allow that, that judge um, to provide a well-informed decision about whether or not the New Hampshire trust is a marital asset to be split between um, the spouses. So. Um, it's, it can be very, very useful in that case to be able to go back to a New Hampshire trust court. It's not a general court of chancery. It's not a, um, 
you know, probate and family court. It's it's just a trust trust court hearing trust cases. So one I'll of the questions there. that yeah, this is great. One of the questions that we've gotten um, from various folks in the audience is sort of we've gone through a lot of the highlights of New Hampshire trust law. And we know that there are other jurisdictions in the U.S. that have um, advantageous trust laws. And so if each of you could think about one or two of the top differences, distinctive, distinctive differences in New Hampshire that might um, counsel a, a client to utilize New Hampshire versus one of those other advantageous trust jurisdictions, um, can you chime in now with those? Uh, I'm, I'm happy happy to quickly and then let david um i'm happy to chime in so honestly there are some really great states not just new hampshire um with with similar laws um similar income tax advantages similar decanting statutes i think we've mentioned um you know the two things that i would highlight so the dedicated trust court for the reasons i just gave um I think that's that's one, but also in, in one of the, the example before that, um, being able to open up um, the trust distribution provisions through a decanting, um, that is unique to New Hampshire. As far as I know, it's the, the only state where you can do that. And um, you can imagine from the example that I gave how, how helpful that would be to be able to distribute out principal earlier than was originally written in the trust. So that's, those are my two. David? Uh, as I say, from the client perspective, um, we have some old trusts that are out there that really um, are income only or um, don't provide for an immediate access to principal. And the fact that you can decant in New Hampshire when you have some of these quirky trusts has been very attractive, especially some very old trusts that we've seen. And, you know, so again, so long as we'll put every disclaimer on it. So long as you're not violating the material purpose of the trust, you can do it. And and so that's one of the things that attracts us uh, to New Hampshire for purposes of their decanting. Um, uh, the, and I do work in, in many other states and, and some of it is just very nuanced based upon the client and, and what the client wants. Um, I think the, the, the way in, in New Hampshire that you can um, really divide up, or as I said earlier, divide and conquer with so many different roles and different people uh, that you can put in place. You know, the good news is you can do it and you can really um, have a pure, pure administrative trustee in New Hampshire and, and really have all of those different jobs properly discharged. Of course, the con to that is you have a whole bunch of people <laughs> who are now involved in this trust. Uh, but uh, I think those are the two reasons that, uh, you know, again, for the appropriate client that we have gone to New Hampshire. Um, but our, our first attraction was the decanting statute. And with one or two clients, they were attracted to the quiet trust nature uh, as they were setting up substantial gifts for their grandchildren. Terrific. Um, I think there are some questions as well. We only have about a minute left, but there are some questions about um, decanting while the grantor has is still alive versus when the when the grantor has died. And can you talk a little bit about um, whether New Hampshire has any distinction between those two? I guess um, I'll express that. The biggest distinction I would say is that when you have a live grantor, um, you can still can't in either in either situation, but when you have a live grantor who can maybe sign an affidavit which says that the decanting is consistent with his intentions, um, and that you know you the donor understands that the trustee is undertaking the decanting, but um, but provides the statement that it's consistent with his or her intent. Um, I I think that that is incredibly helpful, especially as the trustee undertaking the decanting, to have to be able to get some sort of statement like that um, from the donor. Obviously, you can't get that if the donor is, is deceased, um, but it's extremely helpful and I think really supports the decanting um, if, you can, if you can get that. And sometimes you can. I, I agree. And if, if the donor has already died, 
it's really understanding what the material purpose of the trust is. And you, you certainly can't go back to her or him and try to document it, but you can look um, at what they did, what they said in the trust, what they didn't say in the trust. If they said in the trust, I never want principal distributed ever, um, okay, that's, that's pretty powerful. But oftentimes there were things that they just simply either didn't think about or if they were alive now and you asked them, they'd say, oh, of course, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely easier if the donor can sign an affidavit. I think not only do trustees feel better, but maybe practitioners feel better that we know that we're all on the same page. Um, but uh, I've worked on just as many where the donor is not around and it's really trying to drill down and find out what, what did the donor intend when they set this, this trust up. All right, well, thank you both so much for this. Thank you to the audience for all of your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all of them. Um, this was a terrific discussion. Over to you, Susan. Thanks. Um, yes, I, I second that. It was a great discussion, and I'd like to thank our speakers, Suma, David, and Thander, really for an outstanding presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank Fiduciary Trust for making today's webinar possible. Once you leave the event, a short survey will pop up in your browser window, and we'd appreciate it if you would share your feedback on the event as it helps us to provide you with content that's most interesting for you. And also, if you're an attorney, you're gonna to need to put the code word into that survey to get your CLE. On behalf of Trust in the States, have a great day.